This is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices Energy Week, episode number one, was recorded on May 8th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. Energy Week is a new podcast format focused specifically on crude oil and energy markets. I'll be joined each week by a panel of three expert guests. For this first episode, I'll be joined by petroleum geologist Art Berman, consultant Anas Alhaji, and commercial broker Pat Hemsworth. Next week's panel will include former market regulator Chris Cook, Hedge Eye Energy Markets Chief Joe McMonagall, and professional crude oil trader Tracy Shukart, call sign Shy Girl on Twitter. We'll start each show with the EIA data, then we'll introduce our panelists and ask them what's got their attention this week in markets, and then we'll take on a couple of discussion topics which were chosen by our panelists and which were requested by you, our listeners. Finally, I'll ask each of our panelists what they'll be watching for in the week ahead. Our goal is to create the premier podcast on the internet for energy market traders and followers. So please pass the word about this free new podcast on to your friends and colleagues. Now let's dive right into this week's official EIA inventory data. Crude oil drew down 4 million barrels nationally, and that was against API reporting a build of 2.8 million barrels and consensus expectations of about a 1.9 million barrel build. So pretty big drawdown there, unexpected and very much out of consensus. Cushing, Oklahoma, on the other hand, building 821,000 barrels. Gasoline drawing down 596,000 barrels, distillates drawing down 159,000 barrels. The immediate tape action was muted considering how bullish of a surprise that was. We did end up with WTI moving and closing above its five-day moving average at 61 spot 88, but it never even got as far as the eight-day moving average at 62 spot 55. And considering the unexpected bullish inventory surprise, that says to me that this market is looking a little bit tired. U.S. production ticked down just slightly to 12.2 million barrels, just 100,000 barrels shy of that 12.3 million barrel all-time record just set a week or two ago. Imports 6.7 million barrels per day, 46.9 million barrels on the week. Exports 2.3 million barrels per day or 16.3 million barrels on the week. Now let's meet this week's expert panel. Art Berman is a petroleum geologist who spends most of his time drilling oil wells, but he's also become a favorite keynote speaker and consultant to investors. Art also prepared a slide deck, which you can find on the homepage at macrovoices.com in the description of the article for this podcast. Art, what's on your mind this week relative to markets? And feel free to reference your slide deck. Right, Eric. Well, first, uh, thank you for having me and uh, the other experts here. This is uh, a great new experience for, I hope, all of us and uh, looking forward to it. What's on my mind this week is basically just how well behaved the pricing is that if we look at my slide number two, I'm showing my comparative inventory analysis of both WTI and Brent. I'm not going to go into the details of it because the those can be found elsewhere on the Macro Voices website or on my website. But the point of both of these is to say that as of today's storage report, WTI plots exactly on the comparative inventory yield curve. We're just barely above the five-year average. And what that says is that we now know for sure that the market clearing price of the marginal WTI barrel is about $62. Looking at the graph on the right, we just got the EIA STEO data for OECD minus US, which is which I'm showing there. The April data again plots right on the 2019 yield curve. What this all means, and the reason that it's so interesting to me is that for people who think that oil prices are going to go to $90 or $100 or whatever, and we hear an awful lot about that, this comparative inventory calibrates that and says, wow, if you think that's true, 
then we've got to lose a ton of inventory because at the rate we're going, no matter what happens, we're going to stay in the approximate ranges that we've been. So that's that's really the big deal. Now, sentiment-driven excursions, yeah, we've seen some big ones here in the last couple of months. We can go up $15, down $15, but eventually fundamentals pull us back. The other thing on slide three that's caught my attention, I mentioned this a little bit last week when we talked, Eric, was is that the the forward curves are behaving in a really interesting way, and that is price has been falling, front month price, and yet the steepness of the backwardation, particularly of Brent, it just keeps increasing. And so despite the fact that the oil price rally seems to be over for now, the markets are still feeling a real sense of urgency out there. What that says to me is look out for sentiment-driven price shifts. And finally, slide number four, this is the, the latest uh, U.S. and world production. If we want to know why basically the world doesn't feel that much urgency despite Iran, Libya, blah, 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 U.S. production increased 180,000 barrels a day. In April, we're at 12.2 million barrels a day. World liquids, yeah, we, we dropped down from the, the super high in October, but we're going up again. We gained another 100,000 barrels a day. Iran, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's an artificial outage that can and I predict will be changed when oil prices get too high for the man in the White House. In Libya, a scary thing going on over there, pretty darn uncertain, but hey, April production was the highest it's been since May 2013. So, you know, there, there's a lot to worry about in the world as far as supply shortage, but the data right now says it looks pretty stable, and I'd be surprised to see prices go terribly much higher than they are, except based on sentiment. So that's that's what's got my attention this week, Eric. Well, you've got a lot on your mind, Art. Let's move on to our second panelist, Pat Hemsworth. Pat is a commercial broker with Paragon Global Markets, and her decades of experience in both the paper and physical markets give her tremendous insight into the dependencies which exist between markets. Pat, what's caught your attention this week in the market? Well, as you know, right now in the United States, uh, we are in turnaround season, which means that we're in a period of shoulder demand, and it's a natural time for U.S. refineries to put their refineries through maintenance and uh, to configure them for uh, spring and summer gasoline production. And uh, normally that what happens during this period of time is that product inventories, particularly begin to draw down and uh, crude oil inventories tend to to increase. And so what we've seen is uh, pretty much a normal kind of pattern, except for the fact that we had so many unplanned outages. It started with Pad 1. We had series of fires and snafus, Bayway, PBF had an issue. We had problems with uh, PES. And so it started there. Then we had problems with the explosion of the uh, tanks at Deer Park, which uh, caused interruptions of refinery production there because of problems with crude intake. We had fires in Pad 2. And, you know, it's sort of like we're almost out of the turnaround season, but just, you know, in a perfect storm sort of way. I guess 10 days ago, we had more issues in California, which El Segundo, uh, Chevron El Segundo was going through turnarounds. And uh, then we had a big problem at uh, Valeros La Benicia. So what happened last week, uh, beginning of last week, was that we had uh, cash prices of CBOB trading at 60 cents premiums to NYMEX. So, you know, what started to happen was that gasoline was being pulled from all parts of the country, sort of starving pad one, which is our benchmark for uh, NYMEX gasoline. So 
anyway, right now we are finding out that there's 24 cargoes pointed towards the U.S. West Coast from everywhere, from India, from the U.S. Gulf Coast, which has to use a Jones Act vessel. So that, you know, that's kind of challenging in terms of economics and also from Europe. So what happened today was that, and uh, really from Friday, we started to get a pullback in gasoline, even though we had a draw in the, uh, the EIAs, but the cash markets weakened. And we're starting to see a flip again in the uh, the movement of gasoline versus uh, heating oil. So that was on my mind. Plus the you know of course the tariff issue, which we found out on um, on Sunday night, and the markets just gapped down. It was just really sort of ugly. And today, you know, I can say that the market recovered late in the day, but. You know, it it has an eerie feeling right now as far as sentiment is concerned. We saw a drop off in open interest yesterday. So I think there is some nervousness about what, you know, what's happening on that front. But anyway, we're moving along. And in terms of Art was talking about timing. But I think, you know, when we look at the seasonal factors right now, the normal kind of state of affairs is that there's a drop off in crude demand because of the turnarounds, but we'll be out of them in a couple of weeks. And what we'll start to see is a natural pickup in demand for crude. And what we're seeing now, I mean, I think we're going to talk about this more, but we're seeing demand for certain grades of crude, you know, that are uh, the heavier crudes are trading at premiums now are trading in ways that we haven't seen for a long time. So these are some of the things that I noticed here, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of drama in the product markets. And our final panelist for this week is Dr. Anas Alhaji, who is an author, keynote speaker, and energy markets expert. Anas was formerly the chief economist for NGP Energy Capital Management and also taught energy economics at the University of Oklahoma and Colorado School of Mines. Anas, what's in your mind relative to energy markets this week? Thanks, Eric. What's on my mind, basically, is your program. So my comments are intended to show the importance of your show. Heightened volatility is built in because of politics, violence in some of the oil-producing countries, weather, technical, and economic issues. As you all know, oil is a strategic and political commodity, and this is on full display today. Some oil is produced and transported in some of the least stable regions in the world, and this is on full display today. Oil is produced in some of the harshest climates, from the coldest to the hottest weather, from the deserts to the deep offshore. This is on full display at various times of this year, and we will see more of it during the forthcoming hurricane season where oil imports and exports are affected. As Pat mentioned, refineries are mechanical and technological marvels that come with planned and unplanned outages that is on full display today. All demand is correlated with economic growth. Forecast a change with every new data released. This is on full display today. On weekly basis, prices react to changes in U.S. inventories. The U.S. is the only country in the world that releases weekly data. Investors and traders are fixated with such data. This is also on full display today. The bottom line, Eric, here is volatility is built in. Confusion is built in. Frustration is built in. Misinformation is built in. Misunderstanding is built in. As you can see, too many unpredictable moving parts. And that shows the importance of this weekly program. Here is the problem. As if everything I have mentioned is not enough, data quality deteriorated significantly in recent months, making the situation even worse. EIA record high adjustment number indicates a serious problem with the data. While good data can reduce volatility, some of the OPEC members can only prevent extreme volatility. I repeat, extreme volatility as long as they are willing to cut production and have large spare capacity. 
So the oil market is operating in a very complex and difficult environment, which explains the divergence of views and sometimes extreme views. And when we talk about views, this is why I disagree with R today. The rally, the oil rally, has just started. And I think Pat already alluded to that when she talked about the refinery demand. Looking at the current market, the main problem is planned and unplanned refinery outages, just as Pat mentioned. Storage build in recent weeks was caused by lower refinery utilization because of refinery outages. Without refinery outages, storage would have been about 30 million barrels lower. Going forward, we will see frequent large draws. Currently, U.S. commercial crude storage is high by any standard. So that supports Art's view. But Saudi efforts in cutting exports will not pay off unless U.S. refinery crude inputs increase by at least 1 million barrels a day. So we need both. We need the Saudis to continue their production cut, and we need refinery utilization to go up. All right. Well, we've got a fantastic panel for our first show. Coming up next, we'll dive into our first discussion topic. Since this is our first episode, we decided to start by taking on a very high-level topic this week. In the intermediate to long term, are we headed for an energy glut or an energy crisis? Perhaps the most popular mainstream narrative that you'll hear is both IEA and EIA believe that shale production is set to increase in coming years, bringing even more supply online. Meanwhile, the electric vehicle revolution is likely to lead to a so-called peak oil demand event where global fossil fuel consumption peaks and enters a permanent condition of declining demand as fossil fuels are replaced by electricity. Now, frankly, I'm pretty skeptical of that narrative myself. For starters, the people pushing it never seem to mention where the energy needed to produce that electricity is going to come from. More to the point, I think that markets haven't fully digested the fact that shale oil could be defined as using technology to use up finite resources much more quickly than was previously possible. Seems to me that eventually shale is going to play out, and that could be a setup for us having to go back to tar sands and deep water offshore and so forth in order to compensate for the production declines that will occur in the elephant oil fields. And frankly, when I hear about the pending electric vehicle revolution, the people doing the talking never seem to bring up minor details like who's going to rebuild the entire electrical distribution grid in order to support such widespread adoption of electric vehicles. So are we headed for a glut where continued growth of unconventional production overwhelms declining global fossil fuel demand? Or are we headed towards an energy crisis where suddenly shale isn't going to be enough to keep up with growing global demand? Art Berman, let's start with you, since I know you've got a lot to say on this subject. Well, thanks, Eric. Yeah, first of all, I think that the EIA, IEA models are are very sophisticated. And so the the weakness, if there is a weakness, is, is in the underlying assumption. And the underlying assumption, of course, is that you can take some kind of projection from current production and assume that that's where we're going in the future. And when I look at the proved reserves and the production forecasts by all of these agencies, we're going to exceed or going to exhaust current proved reserves in less than five years, no matter how you play the game. And I know that that companies are booking reserves as aggressively as they are allowed to. And so the the question is, where's all this oil going to come from? I mean, it's sort of an unknown. And and so I, I'm concerned about that. The other thing I'm concerned about is is the oil quality issue that that somehow in all of this modeling, even though they're incredibly smart people at all of these international agencies, it seems that somehow they're not too worried about the fact that most of this ultralight tight oil is not very useful for making things other than gasoline and we're you know we're coming into you know IMO 2020 and diesel is already 
pretty much the leading export product in the world. So, I mean, that's a problem that we have to deal with. So, so my take is that that the shale players in all but the Permian Basin have been focused on core areas. That's the reason for the productivity gains. And in the process, they're exhausting their future high-performing wells. So I think that I, I don't anticipate that we're going to see an energy crisis because of shale production in the next couple of years. But I think we need to worry about three, four, or five years out. So that, that's my take. Pat Hemsworth, what's your take? Are we looking at a glut or a crisis in coming years? Well, I really can't make a projection far into the future. What I'm looking at now and projected, say, for the next year or so is a continued quest really to get the heavier oils. And, um, you know, one of your listeners, I think, brought up the point of IMO 2020. And uh, what we're seeing right now is a need for refineries to have the proper crude qualities in order to get a better yield of uh, low sulfur distillates that are appropriate for the um, the new changing regulations for next year for bunker fuels. We're going from a very high sulfur 3.5% to 0.5%. And uh, so what I'm watching here near term, I mean, I think maybe Art, you know, as a geologist may have some views about the uh, the health of the wells and um, perhaps Anas has some, some views about this as well. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm really watching very closely the crudes that are needed right now to make the proper products that we need going forward. And, um, you know, I think what we've been experiencing so far, you know, in the product markets is seeing how the shale crude production tends to produce a little bit too much of light ends. And we saw that at the beginning of the year, the beginning of the um, turnaround year, I should say, that really starts in February in the U.S. Gulf. Our gasoline stocks were over the five year uh, band. And, you know, and one of the reasons people talk about is, is really a quality issue in that we have cheap shale here and it was run very heavily. So the crude slate has become lighter. So what's happening is that. As we get closer to this uh, deadline of the uh, 2020 uh, implementation of uh, the new rules, there's a concern that we just don't have enough of the proper crudes, the heavier crudes, which are uh, appropriate for um, refineries that are configured for the lower API crudes. So we're seeing a kind of battle in the marketplace right now for appropriate crudes. We're seeing right now Saudi Arabia gave us the least amount of crude that we've seen in years on this API report. And at the same time, they said to their Asian clients who were sort of bumped because of the Iranian waivers that didn't happen, they said, okay, we'll we'll supply you with what you need for Iran. So we have like a kind of, I guess, like musical chairs going on with people trying to get from different locations, the appropriate and the optimal crudes. So that's what I'm seeing. And part of this, of course, is what's happened with Venezuela. They were a big source of heavy crudes for uh, for Citgo and for some of the big, sophisticated refineries in the Gulf. Although we weren't using Iranian crude, the um, displacement of that crude caused more competition in the market for appropriate heavier crudes. So, you know, it's a scramble right now. So that's kind of how I'm seeing it. That's sort of my orientation. I'm not quite sure all the way down the road where we stand. I mean, as far as electric vehicles, I don't know really where that all begins to, where that curve sort of kicks in. I also agree that um, there has to be some real continued work on our electric grid in order to, to make electric vehicles work. It's really part of a big grand project, but it's being implemented in, in pieces. So I don't really know when that, that happens. And I know that India is probably not talking about electric vehicles or, you know, at this point. So, um, you know, my orientation, as I say, is, is really around products and the products that are necessary to be produced and the crudes that people are looking for 
in order to produce the optimal amount of products that we need. You know, one of the things that I watch very closely also is this relationship, the price relationship between gasoline and heating oil. And, you know, we have many, many, many different grades and locations, but, you know, our benchmarks are New York Harbor, HO is really, it was called heating oil once upon a time. They kept all the symbols, but it's ultra low sulfur diesel. And that, I will look at that versus gasoline. And right now we are getting ready, well, in a few months, we'll be very, very focused on producing enough of this distillate for IMO 2020. So we need the right crudes for that. Pat, you and uh, and Art both mentioned IMO 2020, so I want to come back to that subject in just a minute. But let's let Anas weigh in first. Anas, where are we headed? Is it crisis or glut? No, it is a crisis. We are heading for a crisis for several reasons. Crude quality, which Art mentioned, is a reason. Decline rates, uh, which Art mentioned too, is another reason. The demand side that Pat mentioned is a third reason. But let's look at the current situation. If you look at long-term forecasts, specifically if you look at IEA and OPEC, what you find is that they are overestimating production and underestimating growth in demand. The overestimation of production is coming from several sources, including the crude quality, which I know we'll talk about it a little bit more later. But what happened is they are exaggerating the impact of fuel efficiency in engines, which has nothing to do with EVs, but they are talking about 8 to 12 million barrels a day decline in the next 22 years, which is impossible. So there is exaggeration on that part of the demand. Then we have exaggeration on the impact of EVs. Notice that I said the impact of EVs. I did not say the number of EVs. The reason why I say the impact, because most of the numbers we see before us, I'm not going to name any names, but they are flawed. And the reason why they are flawed, because in many cases, they replaced CNG buses. They replaced CNG vehicles, whether in the United States or China or India or in Europe. So they counted that as diesel, and that is a complete nonsense. They are using the average fuel efficiency for cars while EVs are replacing the most efficient cars. So that's a problem with the calculation. And there are more problems than that. They are exaggerating the future of EVs because they are ignoring some policy issues, such as what we are going to do with millions and millions of batteries that are very toxic batteries, and who is going to pay for that? How we are going to replace gasoline taxes that states and other nations basically depend on? As you know, the price of gasoline in some European countries consists of almost 70% of that are taxes. How they are going to compensate for those taxes? And then, as you all know, the metals and minerals used in those batteries exist only in very few countries. So will policymakers accept dependence on very few countries where Chinese and Russian companies are operating in those countries? So we have several issues about the future that are exaggerated. Then they are underestimating demand uh, or future demand in Europe. So you put all of that together with the fact that the hype of shale and its impact is scaring investors worldwide, is scaring OPEC members and national oil companies from investment. So you have lower investment on one side, you have exhaustion and depletion on the other, and then you have demand that's going to soar. And you add all of that together, we are heading for an energy crisis. Okay, let's come back to a subject that both Art and Pat brought up. And we also had a listener request, a hedge fund manager in London emailed and asked us to cover the subject of IMO 2020. Now, for any listeners who may not be familiar with this issue, let me explain it briefly. When you watch a large ship steaming out of port, let's say leaving New York Harbor, headed to Hong Kong, halfway around the world, it's going to be traveling for you know 10,000 miles. They're burning 
low sulfur diesel fuel in their engines as they're steaming out of New York Harbor, but they only burn that fuel for the first 10 miles or so, literally, out of a 10,000-mile journey. As soon as they get into international waters, they switch over to a different fuel called bunker fuel, which has approximately seven times as much environment-polluting sulfur in it as the low-sulfur diesel fuel, which they were using when they steamed out of port because no sane country in their right mind would allow them to operate inside of any country using bunker fuel. So for many decades now, the shipping industry has essentially gotten away with, okay, we'll comply with environmental laws when we're inside of countries. And when we're out in the open ocean, we'll just ignore all of that stuff and burn bunker fuel instead. The result of that is the entire industry is kind of built around assumptions about how much bunker fuel needs to be produced and how much diesel fuel needs to be produced. All of the sudden, starting in 2020, the International Maritime Organization is mandating that all ships at sea use low sulfur fuels, under 0.5% sulfur. That's going to really dramatically change requirements. And I, I think one of the things that is not at all clear to me is, does this really change the demand for crude oil in a way where, sure, there's still plenty of crude oil, but all of a sudden we don't have the right grades of crude oil that are needed to achieve the refining objectives, which have now changed rather dramatically, because all of a sudden you can't use as much sour oil that's full of sulfur because you've got to create a product that doesn't have as much sulfur in it. Pat Hemsworth, what does this mean in terms of, we know the old requirements for how refineries operated. They had a certain set of grades that went in and a certain set of grades that come out. How is that going to change post IMO 2020? Well, one of the things that is true about shale is that it yields higher light ends, meaning higher amounts of gasoline. And this was um, fine in a certain environment, but now there's kind of a crunch for us to get more middle distillates with low sulfur. So various different transportation sectors are competing with one another for these low sulfur fuels. And so as a result, we just need more distillate production. And from my understanding of the uh, optimal crudes that are needed, uh, they would be heavier crudes and crudes with, uh, with lower APIs. So, you know, what, what some people are afraid of is that in order to produce the optimal amount of distillates and using shale, they would actually create a, uh, a gasoline glut. But with the more sophisticated refineries, with the Nelson ratings of you know, more sophisticated um, capabilities, they're able to process uh, heavy crudes, even sulfurous crudes and sour crudes, and, or even use um, high sulfur fuel oil. But we just don't have, you know, there's just tremendous competition right now for those high yielding distillate crudes. So, you know, I don't know if any of the other engineers, Art, has anything to say about that or, or on us, but uh, that's my understanding that, you know, there will be good competition for the heavier and uh, even sulfurous crudes, but um, it, it, heavy sweet or even sulfurous is okay, but, you know, just heavier, the heavier barrel. Art Berman, how is this affecting the market? Because needless to say, most of the shale production is much lighter crudes. Right. And one of the, the facts that is, I think, lost on, on many people is that ultralight oil, high API gravity oil, simply lacks many of the middle distillate grade components that are required to make distillate. I mean, it, it, it varies, of course, not all tight oil is the same, but generally speaking, as, as Pat said, Tight oil is, is, is pretty good for gasoline. It does have to be reformulated. It has to be upgraded because it, it tends to make low octane gasoline. But, but most of our refineries are, are, are capable of doing that. But you can't create middle distillates where they don't exist to begin with. So, so to me, that is the, the glaring issue of, of oil quality. It's not that, that the ultralight oil isn't high quality. As Pat said, you know, it's 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 very low sulfur, 
And back before the world depended on, on diesel, it was more highly valued than, than the heavier, more sulfurous grades for that reason. So, so that's, that's a problem. But the observation, and you know, maybe, maybe my, my colleagues here can help me out with that, but, but when I look at the way the futures market is approaching distillate, both in terms of you know, the heating oil that Pat mentioned and also the Brent gas oil, the message I take from it is they're just not worried. I mean, the the open interest on the combined Brent plus WTI distillate, the net interest, you know, the net long positions, it's way lower. It's you know like seventy eight percent lower so far in two thousand nineteen than it was in two thousand eighteen. So I don't really know how to interpret this except to say that apparently the people that you know that that make these bets are reasonably comfortable for some reason that the refineries and the crude suppliers are going to figure this out. The other thing I'll throw in is that I, I think from, you know, I'm not an expert on bunker fuels or any of these other things for that matter, but in talking to people who are, it seems like most of the crunch is going to come pretty much in the next year or so when everybody's scrambling to meet these standards. But but the scrubbers are ultimately going to relieve a lot of the the demand for for low sulfur fuel it's just that they you know i mean some of its the, the quality is going to improve but ultimately one of the the lower cost ways to deal with it is is just to is to scrub the sulfur out of it but that's going to take a few years to implement so i'm at the limit of my knowledge there so i'm going to leave it well art i think that's a great place to leave off because our next discussion is going to be all about crude quality and why it matters that's coming up right after this. Now let's focus on a topic that all three of our panelists have very strong views about. The fact that crude quality matters and not all grades of crude oil are created equal. Politicians and mainstream financial media don't seem to understand that just because the United States is now producing even more crude oil than Saudi Arabia, that doesn't mean that we don't still need to import oil. Most of them fail to recognize that all of this wonderful shale oil that we're producing in the United States can't even be refined by U.S. refineries until it's been mixed with heavy oil blend stock. And some of the best sources of that heavy blend stock are places like Iran and Venezuela, which have both recently become the targets of aggressive U.S. foreign policy. Anas Alhaji, let's start with you because you wrote an excellent article for the Financial Times on this subject. You also prepared a chart deck. Listeners, you can find the download link for the chart deck on our homepage at macrovoices.com in the description of this article. I encourage you to download it because Anas has some fantastic graphs and charts. Anas, tell us all about this subject. I am not going to go over the charts. I'm just going to sum it up with the following two ideas. We have a mismatch between the crude produced and the refining capabilities to handle that crude. We have already hit a refining wall in the United States. That's why we are exporting this crude overseas. Now, some refineries are trying to expand, so they might handle more, but we are already at the limits right now. The second point is, and I think this is the point that's missing from the discussion worldwide, that we have a mismatch between the products we get from shale and the products that are demanded in the future. In fact, even if you look at the IEA, the International Energy Agency forecast, you see that mismatch in their own outlook because it seems that the people who work on the supply side did not talk to the people who work on the demand side. So we have this conflict between the products on the supply side and the products on the demand side. Here, when we look at this, we found out that even with the expansion of refineries, we are not going to take that much light crude. Most of the expansion basically is medium to heavy. So the idea that this crude will always find a market is absolutely not correct. To go back to IMO 2020, we have this problem there. Shale is not going to help with the IMO 2020. As Pat said, it is going to help if you kill the gasoline market. If you flood the gasoline market, so refiners will lose millions of and probably billions of dollars 
because of that, it works. Otherwise, if they are going to maximize, they are not going to produce that much gasoline and therefore they are not going to produce that much diesel from shale. The other point, just to mention about IMO 2020, is that with those scrubbers, we have a serious problem too because they need a lot of water. And now we are hearing that this water will be banned from being discharged into the ocean. So where that water is going to go on the ship. A third point is if car companies can cheat on their emissions, believe it that ship owners are going to cheat on IMO 2020. Pat Hemsworth, are we headed toward a critical shortage of heavy oil blend stock that's needed to mix with light oil being produced by the shale wells? Uh, Are we going to get to a situation where there's just not enough heavy oil to mix those other oils down to something that's refinable? Well, I I think that it's definitely going to be a kind of um, elbowing of players in the marketplace, and we're seeing it already. You know, I just wanted to tell a story about Venezuela. When the market began to to really sell off after OPEC's uh, kind of free production policy that kind of hit the market in 2015, you know, I watched the market come down and I just thought, what is going to happen with Venezuela? And I just kind of, I became fascinated with the effect on certain countries of the, the drop in crude. And I imagined a kind of fat tail event. But it never happened. As bad as Venezuela is, it never happened. And but what did happen is that, you know, in our world, all of the differentials began to shift really dramatically. Everything heavy and everything sour or the heavier crudes all began to rally versus our our light sweet benchmarks. So our benchmarks, Brent and uh, WTI, are light sweet crudes. So all of these relationships, Dubai versus Brent, Mars versus WTI, Maya versus uh, WTI, all of the heavy to lighter, heavy, sour, even heavy, sweet to, to light, sweet benchmarks have completely shifted. And one other thing that's kind of interesting is that um, we were talking about scrubbers and implementing scrubbers because a lot of people think that high sulfur fuel oil, you know, will be very, very cheap. So it might be used to, uh, it'd be so cheap that it will make sense to, to just buy that and get scrubbers. But what's happened because of the the problems with accessing the heavier crudes is that in the more sophisticated refineries, now HSFO, the high sulfur fuel oil, is now being used as feedstock in refineries to come up with more distillates. So as Art mentioned before, certain kinds of crude like shale don't produce enough distillates and they don't have those hydrocarbons in them. But the uh, high sulfur fuel oil is now being used as feedstock. So we're seeing elbowing in the marketplace for the right kinds of crude. I think, you know, there's a a geopolitical overlay here. And, uh, you know, the way things are right now really suggests that there is going to be a big shakeup, particularly as we as we get closer to the implementation of IMO 2020. You know, one thing that Art pointed out, and he's right, is that right now it appears that people are not interested in uh, the speculative community, the investor community is not particularly worried about this IMO 2020. But in fact, what we had seen, this is so interesting, I think, <laughs> We saw last fall a 55 cent premium of distillate versus gasoline. And what happened, I mean, as we started moving towards, uh, you know, the we had a crazy Christmas, as you know, and then we came out of that and then um, refineries started going into turnarounds. And lo and behold, we started working down the gasoline inventories, working down the gasoline inventories, and we had various issues with the turnaround period. But what happened is that we moved from 55 cents a premium on distillates to a four cent discount. And then, you know, this is how quickly things move. But I think it's after we came out of this period of crisis with gasoline, 
what happened just over the last couple of days is that we went, now we're at a 10 cent premium on distillate. Distillate is starting to turn around and the gasoline is, is weakening a little bit. And we'll see more of that as we start moving through the season. And as we get to late third quarter, early fourth quarter, you're going to see a whole new kind of configuration. People are going to be quite concerned. And I think, you know, some of the engineers that I speak to, the chemical engineers tell me that product quality is an issue as well. You know, there's different formulas that people could use to create 0.5% sulfur distillate for fuel, but some of them are unstable. And so there is some concern that producing enough marine gas oil, which is the most stable, is going to be a problem going into the fourth quarter. So I think I think you're going to see a big shift in that spread. And also, the other thing, too, that you said, Art, and I just, um, uh, just want to point it out, is that because of this high sulfur fuel oil being used as a feedstock, the differential is like sort of this kind of cognitive dissonance, but it's like counterintuitive that that the high sulfur fuel oil should be too expensive really to use. You know, so it's kind of arguing against the price differentials between low sulfur fuel oil and high sulfur fuel oil have narrowed to a point where at this point anyway, scrubbers are not economical. So I think that we do have a kind of potential crisis on our hands and it's related to crude quality. Art Berman, I want to ask you about an aspect of this that I know you have some strong opinions on. Is this just a matter of people outside the energy industry not getting it? You know, politicians think that all crude oil is the same as other crude oil. Or is it deeper than that? Are we actually in a situation where the energy industry is diluting itself by failing to recognize all of the implications of the fact that not all crude grades are created equal? You're right, Eric. I, I do have some uh, strong opinions about that, and I'll, I'll try to be generous and moderate when I talk about it. But first of all, let me say that the analysts and the journalists and the politicians that, that talk about energy are, are very sophisticated, knowledgeable, interesting people. But very few of them have any experience whatsoever in petroleum. They don't have any any education in it. They've never worked in the petroleum industry. And therefore, some of what they learn is from biased sources, you know, the companies themselves. And those of us who, who've actually been in the industry, who have backgrounds in petroleum, often come up with a very different view. And so my belief is that the industry promotes itself, as all industries do, and they want people to believe that that all the things that Pat and Honest and I are talking about are simply not problems or or there's some magical technological solution to them all. And I think what all three of us are saying on the issue of crude oil quality is, wow, we hope there is, but we sure don't know what it is. <laughs> and that's going to be a problem. And, and so, for instance, the assumption by so many really smart people is that the whole problem with ultra light oil is is just what what Anas mentioned before, which is well we've we've hit a wall and U.S. refineries can't take any more of it. Well, guess what? Global refineries are designed the exact same way, most of them, as U.S. refineries, which is to say that they're designed for the medium grade crude oils that dominate global supply, and so. Exporting it, yeah, you can, you can export a certain amount, but you can't just you can't export as much as you want. There's 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 a ceiling to that, and basically, you have to displace somebody else's light oil to get yours in. So, I think that that we want to believe this American exceptionalism. We want to believe that all things are possible, and look at what we've done. We've you know we're producing more oil than Saudi Arabia, and isn't that great? Well, I don't know. It's it's okay, I suppose. But ultimately, not all problems can be resolved. And I think that's what the three of us are saying. So I think it's time for for investors to take note. And I agree completely with my colleagues here in that we can argue about when there's going to be an energy crisis, but all of the elements are there. And it's just a matter of, you know, how do you how do you manipulate that Rubik's Cube? 
And so there's tremendous opportunities for investors who understand uh, a little bit of what the real issues are. Well, I'm sure we could go on for hours with this fascinating conversation, but in the interest of time, I think we should leave it there for our first episode. So listeners, this is our first episode, and we need your feedback on the format as well as your requests for what topics we should discuss in future episodes. We also need your help putting the word out that there's a new podcast in town, and we intend to become the definitive weekly information source for energy traders, investors, and others interested in energy markets. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes or at macrovoices.com, and you'll also gain access to our Thursday night podcast, which is much more general and has a macroeconomic focus. Before we close, I want to ask each of our panelists, though, what they're going to be looking for in energy markets in the coming week. Pat Hemsworth, let's start with you. What are you going to be watching for in the coming week in energy markets? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, we have a big dark cloud sort of hanging over our heads, a macro cloud, and this uh, issue of tariffs is sort of coloring everything. And uh, so I think that's one thing. You know, I, I think we'll probably get some sort of feedback on that, whether or not, you know, we have a resolution in a week, but I'll be watching that very closely. Also, I'm going to be watching uh, the spreads. Uh, I'm very oriented, obviously, on products and uh, and the um, downstream, but I'll be watching these spreads that I was talking about, the uh, relationship of heating oil to uh, gasoline, which are beginning to, to shift. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting to see uh, what happens with us coming out of this uh, turnaround period and how that's uh, actually going to begin to affect our inventories. I also am uh, going to be watching WTI Brent, which has, you know, has really been quite volatile. It's been all over the place. And uh, so on a longer term basis, the uh, spread is relatively narrow as it anticipates the infrastructure being built to facilitate more crude being exported. So, however, we did, you know, after the announcement of the Iranian waivers not being continued, we had a blowout in the uh, the Brent versus WTI. And, you know, I think that's because it, it actually affects, you know, the, the Brent is more of an international market. So we blew out there, but it's it's beginning to come back a little bit. So I'm watching that. That's a really important thing for, uh, for our clients. And, um, you know, so I'm also um, going to be uh, looking at, uh, as Art alluded to before, what's going on with the speculative and hedge fund community in terms of open interest and their long positions. You know, right now, just briefly, we are relatively low overall open interest compared to this time last year. In WTI, we were 2.7 million contracts. That was the overall open interest or exposure. Now, it's it's just a shade over 2.1, or it's about 2.15. So, you know, we're significantly below last year. But we have had a blowout in volatility. This was also mentioned. 22%, we were flatlining for a very long time. And when I see that, I begin to get nervous. And it's actually a great indicator in a sense. If you, you have like a very, very long period of low volatility to just after a certain period of time, like you start to wonder what's going to happen. And in fact, we blew out 5% in implied volatility at the money options last week. So I'll be watching that. $60 is a really key point. That's a point you might remember that was the top of the market, you know, when the market was uh, had really collapsed. And that was the sort of target that everybody was looking for. And there's a huge option open interest at those levels. So, you know, that level is one where there's really a tremendous amount of support. So I'm looking at all of these technical factors to give me a sense about what the speculative community or what the hedge fund community is going to be doing. And, you know, I'm watching all the politics too. There's really so many things happening between Libya, Venezuela, the Chinese situation, and, you know, the uh, heightening of tensions with Iran. You know, so I'm monitoring all of that. But, yeah, it should be an interesting week ahead. Anas Alhaji, what are you going to be looking for in the week ahead in the markets? The first thing I'm going to look at is California House Bill AB 345. 
I think it is already dead, but we need the final say on it. Probably it will never be introduced, but this is a very important uh, bill to watch. I am watching refinery utilization. We really need to go above 92%. We need to move forward to see a reduction in storage and higher prices. Just to give you an idea why I am bullish on oil. Between June and April, so that's April 2020, demand of refineries for crude, so this is the uh, through inputs, is 4.6 million barrels a day above today. It's a huge amount. So we are going to see massive draw coming up over the summer and, and prices are going to increase above the level that Pat mentioned. On the political side, and this is very quick, the problem we are having right now is that policymakers are making foreign policy based on the fact that we are producing a lot of oil in terms of quantity, and they are ignoring quality. So the impact of ignoring it is really massive. It's dragging the nation into a war. So focusing on quality is very important even for politicians. And Art Berman, what are you going to be looking for in the week ahead? Well, I'll be very brief. I, I, I'm just looking for the price story to unfold. I understand that both Pat and Honest disagree with me. I, I don't disagree with me. Uh, I think the evidence is clear and all the seasonal things that both of them are talking about, those are both built into the comparative inventory model. They're normalized out. Comparative inventory compares periods of refinery planned outages with previous periods, the same week of the year. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's so important. We just went through a major price collapse from October to December and the market and many of its participants just act like, oh, well, that was that was really sad, but it's over. Those things are never over. That was there for a very, very important reason. The markets were telling the producers, cool it, guys, stop producing like mad. And of course, OPEC has responded, but the U.S. hasn't. So I still think that we're, we're going to see much more modest price rally than, than both my colleagues here believe. But I've been wrong before. I might be wrong again. And before we close, I just want to ask each of our panelists to please tell our listeners where they can follow your work and learn more about what you do. Pat Hemsworth, let's start with you. Yeah, I would encourage people to contact me by email. And I am P. Hemsworth at ParagonGlobalMarkets.com. And if you request a copy of my daily market report, I will send it to you. So uh, please do so. Fantastic. Anas Alhaji. It is my name.com, Anas Alhaji.com. That's website. And people can contact me through the website itself and then through Twitter. Anas Alhaji at Anas Alhaji. And Art Berman. I'm an oil and gas consultant. I'll be glad to help you figure out uh, where to drill wells, how to screen prospects. If you want to know about prices, supply, demand, if you need an expert witness to testify for you, uh, I'm there to do it. My website is artberman.com and you can find me on Twitter at aeberman12. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists. We'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. Macro Voices Energy Week will be released every Wednesday evening. Next week's panel includes former regulator Chris Cook, professional crude oil trader Tracy Shukart, better known as Shy Girl on Twitter, and Hedge Eye Energy Markets Chief Joe McMonagle. For Macro Voices Energy Week, I'm Eric Townsend. See you next week. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. 
Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.